That's an interesting question. I am blind and want to know uh, how you are working to make sure DAP developers are building accessible DAPs. The future must be accessible. Yeah, it's a really interesting question of how do you design around a deficit? Uh, for example, there can be cultural issues. There can be knowledge issues. There could be uh, disabilities like um, hearing problems, in your case, vision problems, also neurological concerns or issues. Uh, for example, some people may be prone to seizures if they see certain light patterns. And that's why you have seizure warnings on certain games. Um, or let's say you're quadriplegic. You can't touch the keyboard, can't access it. So uh, the question then is, uh, what is the standard, the standard operating procedure for accessibility? Uh, and it's been a big question in the web for a long time. The W3C certainly talks about it. Everything from color patterns that are more gentle with the color blind uh, to uh, things like, for example, accessibility for blind users. Just something as simple as putting alt text in a image. So when you're using a screen reader, that the screen reader will actually be able to tell you what the images are. Now, dApps are no different than websites and cell phone applications and desktop applications in that all of the accessibility schemes that we use there also can be used in the user interfaces of dApps. But this is a great example of something that can get lost in the weeds. You design for your neighbor and yourself. There was a great YouTube video uh, that showed uh, the engineering disparities, I think, in Silicon Valley, where they had some sort of optical sensor uh, for a uh, it was either a soap dispenser or a hand dryer in a bathroom. And the issue was all the engineers who built it were white. And so they were the training set uh, for that data. And so when a white person put their hands under it, the dispenser would turn on. But a, a person of color came in and put their hands there. The, the computer algorithm hadn't been trained with that set because there was no one available in that office to do it. And so that when they put their hand under it, the hand dryer doesn't turn on. It's just such a great visual representation that we design for our neighbor and ourselves. We don't design for the world and people who aren't us. Now, when I was at the meditation retreat, uh, one of the exercises we had was this compassion exercise where take a deep breath, you'd be calm, and then you would imagine someone you don't know, and you'd wish that that person safety and health and happiness and peace. Very basic idea of just wishing someone well and to live a good life who you have no connection or attachment to. Uh, and unless someone in your social circle is blind, you yourself are blind, or you know someone who's blind and inspired you, odds are you probably never thought about it. Like, for example, well, the first time I went to Japan, so these little bumps on the sidewalks, and I was always curious, what the hell are those bumps for? And I found out those were walking paths for people who are visually challenged. Uh, and the Japanese government went, put all these tiles in, and if you're blind, you just walk on the bumps, and you kind of know that you're still on a safe sidewalk, and really helps you out. Uh, so little stuff like that, it just, just doesn't make any sense unless you have the right context. So I think the solution to this is diversity and centralization. So if you have lots of dApps coming around and you have these organizations that are inclusive and they're global in nature, you'll get lots of representation, including people who care a lot about accessibility for the hearing impaired, for the visually impaired, or for other issues. And they will make bespoke considerations. Some cases, that's the polyfill situation, where the framework itself, the implementation itself, doesn't natively resolve it. However, there's some augmentation that comes on, and it fills stuff in in a way that helps a person with that. So specialty software. Sometimes that works tremendously well. Other times, not so much. Okay, so like machine translation of text, for example. I can either pay a professional translator to translate a website into Japanese, or you can roll the dice and see if the computer can do a good enough job. You can do that on your end, uh, but maybe you get a good experience or not. The other is native effort, where we actually build frameworks and tooling that assist people uh, for these things. And as we get to refinements of the platform, we get beyond launches, and we start talking about the second wave of apps, the third wave of apps, that's usually where these questions come up. 
as a standards-driven process where you create checklists. And actually, what you can do to ensure that you're represented is when we start talking about certification standards for dApps, level one, level two, level three. Right now, most people are thinking about security and correctness. Can you hack it and does it do what it says it does? But you technically could add accessibility and have a domain of accessibility as part of that standard for higher level certifications. So by definition of something, for example, is level three, maybe it has some capabilities that will assist the common tools of the visually impaired. That's probably a good compromise solution and markets will push people in that way. Really good question.